There's absolute truth that you need to go to work every day thinking it might be your last day. Hi everyone, welcome to today's bonus badge cam lesson here at Active Self Protection. I'm your host, John Correa, and with me as usual, our favorite former Fed, Mike Williver. Today's video comes to us from Houston, Texas. My family and my staff are all covered by firearms legal protection because there is no better resource to help good, sane, sober, moral, prudent people after a use of force. They now have a great newsletter available to everyone for free as well. Sign up at the link below and check out their coverage too. Don't forget to thank them for bringing us today's video. Officers are here to serve a warrant for arrest for a man who has violated his uh, bail orders and so they're gonna revoke his bail. He has been arrested 18 times since 2008. Let's listen in, this one is quite serious. Houston police, come the door. Something just hit the door. Yep. Good morning. Hey, we have a warrant for a <laughs> Ma'am. Where's Dion? Is he awake? Dion, step out here. Is he awake? Ma'am. Ma'am. Yeah, step out here. Okay. Dion, step on out here. You got to take care of some warrants. No. Where is he? Where is he? No, I do not see him. Dion, you need to step out. It's Houston police. Is he behind the door? Dion. There's a door behind the door. She, look, she looked back there towards the back, so. Dion, it's you some police. You need to step out here. <laughs> Dion, it's you some police. Let's do this thing. Dion. There's a door behind the door. She looked back there. Yeah. Dion, it's you some police. You need to step out here. There are guns in the house. Yeah. There guns in the house. Yeah. Shit. Dion, it's you some police. Let's do this thing. <laughs> Dion, it's Houston Police. Let's do this thing. Dion, it's Houston Police. Let's do this thing. You good? You good? No, I'm hit. I'm hit. Let's go get Bill. Somebody get Bill. Oh, 
dig. Where you at, Sarge? No. Where you at, right? Where, you, where Sarge? I don't know. Oh, shit. God damn. Hey, we need to get Bill out. We need to get Bill out of there. We need to get Bill out. Hey, get some cover. Get some cover. Get some cover. He's down. He's down, but I can't see him. Two officers were hit in this particular instance. The officer uh, that laid down there, unfortunately, did not make it, paid with his life. The other sergeant did make it, the perp did not, and let's think about lessons. Serious, serious stuff here, and we do have some lessons. I just want to say in the middle here that our goal here isn't to be critical at all. It's to use this incredible tragedy for learning opportunities. So again, uh, we have nothing but respect here, but let's dig in. Serving these kinds of warrants is incredibly dangerous, and when you see, especially a guy that they know has multiple arrests, including firearms offenses, Man, at some point here, you gotta think, let's back the heck out of here and let SWAT handle it. Yeah, I'm not sure what information they had previous to knocking on this door, but if they knew the guy was armed, and I'm not, I'm not second guessing, I would have liked to have seen them back out, set up a perimeter, contain the scene, call in a specialty team that, that does this sort of thing for a living, that has specialty training, that has flashbangs, that has tools these guys just don't have. And, and again, they've got a lot of officers here. They know this is a problem going in. So again, we don't want to criticize here, but we do want to talk about thinking through these problems ahead of time for next time. Because recognize that the door that they're standing in front of is this big skyline. You know, when in the old days we would call the fatal funnel, right? And, and, and it just shows exactly, hey, bad guys, shoot here. And when you're standing in front of it, you're going to be who he shoots at. I, I like that initially he's off to the side and he's checking with his light, but if you look at it, it's so dark in that place and it's so light outside. So as soon as you're standing in that threshold, like you said, your skyline, you look like a literal silhouette, like a target. Yeah. And of course they're worried about bystanders as well because you know this guy, this dirtbag is a felon, but his mama isn't. And so, okay, ma'am, I gotta talk to him, let him come out. And I really think when we listen to this one, they really gave him every chance. Just like, hey man, come on, let's take care of this stuff almost felt nonchalant and a little too relaxed to me. Maybe a little too relaxed. Their, their, their relaxed appearance may belie their actual sense of, of caution here. I, I gotta say, 
If you're wondering why some cops are aggressive or jerks when they come to the door with something like this, maybe this is why. Maybe yeah. they were a little too nice or a little too nonchalant, like you said. I don't mean to again, I don't mean to second guess, but I think maybe a little bit less casual, a little less um, friendly, a little more official might have might have been preferred here. Also gonna make a recommendation here. Uh, again, handheld light, really important, incredibly important for officers to have. More powerful, more better. You want to light up the inside there like the daylight. You have a, an artificial sun in your hand. I want more candela in order to see into this very dark place, especially when I'm in a light place and I have that kind of a photonic barrier. Now, the officer's got a gun out and in his hand here because he knows that there's guns inside. And, and of course, if you think there's a good chance that this guy might be armed, good chance he might want to fight us, I absolutely want to know uh, that I want a gun in my hand. But if you're this cautious and this curious, back away out of here. Get yourself to a better place where you have some cover. And I don't know what, uh, what sort of long guns they have available to them in this department, but... I would like to have seen one of the two at the front door with a long gun. Absolutely. Now, now here's a spot where we recognize this is just chaos. So obviously people are down and, and, and everything from here is instinctual reaction. First training thing that I see here for once the gunfight is started, you really got to work to train yourself to back away from your cover a little bit. And, and I get it that the, the cover it feels to you like this is where I'm safe. So everybody gets sucked into their cover, but spending a little bit of time training, taking a good step back off that cover will actually keep you safer and give you better angles to engage the threat than hugging it like this. For example, if this knuckle had to come out front and started blasting away at that brick and you're right on top of it, that brick's gonna splinter, it's gonna shatter, it's gonna go in your eyes, it's gonna cause injury, and it's gonna prevent you from returning fire in a meaningful way. And, and not only that, again, he will see you before you see him. So you wanna take a big, hard step back off that cover. And, and again, I think this officer did as good a job as could possibly be expected given all the circumstances and given what's going on. But again, when this guy comes out, you better start getting your hit. So putting yourself in the place to do that incredibly smart. So back up to before the incident started again, we see them here and this is an officer who, who ends up paying with his life and, and our, our greatest condolences to his family and you know to the officers that were there with him that day and the rest of his friends. But I wanna recognize what goes down here. As you see him, they know that there are guns in the house and because he can't see in here very well, because his flashlight is having a hard time penetrating this, he's not able to get enough information. Now, I can't guarantee you that this guy didn't step out from a corner or something like that, but, but this right here is, I think, an excellent example why I want the brightest pocket sun in my hand that I possibly can get with my handheld. Absolutely, this light is, is woefully insufficient for the task. I, I'm, he's lighting up what looks like a, a door or, or a, um, a threshold, and it's just barely, it's just not enough light. Uh, you're, you're shining it from uh, you know, outside where it's sunny into a dark area, so there's, there's a, you know, that's gonna defeat some of the effectiveness of the light, but a way more powerful light is called for in the situation. He's also bouncing some of it off of that little entryway wall there, so again, having a light that can push through photonic barriers incredibly important that helps you search better. And this is where that stuff comes into play. It's not when it's totally dark outside, any light will do when it's totally dark outside. But when you see this kind of situation, that's where a really bright handheld can really help you. Now, what we're gonna see here is that the, the scumbag is going to just step out. He's not gonna talk to him at all. They know he's after him. And, and he's just gonna step out and, and start firing. Now, they're facing here a guy who, what looks to me like, he's just bump firing it off the hip. If you look, just prior to this, they asked the mom, are there guns in there? They did. And they, she said, yeah. She was actually was honest with them, which is unusual in a situation like this. If they tell you there's guns in there, it's time to get the hell out of that doorway. Get out of that threshold. Get out of the way. If this officer could talk to you right now, he'd say, please don't do this. Don't make this same mistake. He paid with his life. If mom tells you there's guns in there, I promise you there's a lot of guns in there. And, and again, once the guy starts firing, if he gets the initiative on this as an officer, you're going to be responding to what the perp does. And since he gets the initiative, if he gets the drop on you like this, there's really nothing you can do. So when we say, how does this officer survive this encounter? As soon as he hears there's guns here, he backs away from that door and doesn't skyline himself. That's the only hope he has. Once they've called him out, she's verified he's there. They've called him out. You know, he's heard you, you know, there's guns in there. We need to right now start treating this like a barricaded suspect because that's what it is in essence. Even though he hasn't yelled out, you know, you never take me alive. You don't need that in this case. 
he's a barricaded suspect. Let's back off. Let's contain this scene as best we can. Let's evacuate neighbors. Let's get the mom, mom out of there and treat this like what it is. Now, we're gonna go back over to the officer who is actually covering the back door at this point. He hears the gunfire, and I really admire his instinct where he goes, oh no, I gotta go to the gunfire, but wait, I'm actually you know, monitoring the back here, and it's a good thing he stayed home because the dude is gonna show up. Now, that said, notice he's got his handheld light out, and now he gets his gun out, and, and we say this all the time on these badge cams, officers, learn to drop what's in your support hand. Please. He, he has a light on his gun. Drop that handheld light and get both hands on the gun. And we mean drop it. Don't put it away, don't mess around. You, there's gunfire right now, you gotta get in the fight. Both hands on the gun is better. You, like John said, you've got a light on the gun. Trust that light, you chose that light for a reason. Now it's time to get into the fight. And yeah, I gotta tell you, being around back, I've been on rear perimeter a bunch of times, being out around back and hearing, I, I never heard gunshots out front. But I've heard a commotion. I've heard a lot of, of, of stuff going on. And your, your natural reaction is to want to get up there and see what's going on. One of the reasons you become a cop is you want to be inside the yellow tape. You want to see the thing that's happening. So it's the, the instinct is to get around front and look. And he did a really good job of stopping himself from doing that. And he, it's necessary that he does. Because what we see right here is, is the guy comes out back and our officer has just a split second to get that shot. And, and maybe, I mean, it wouldn't have ended any better. He's the, the, our perp has already uh, killed an officer and shot a second one. But man, this is a snapshot. This is why you want to have both hands on the gun. Because this is a very difficult shot at speed with two hands on the gun. With one hand on the gun and kind of supporting it with a second hand with a, a light, darn near impossible. It's a difficult shot and it's also the most important shot this officer will ever take in his entire career. Nothing else is going to be more important than this right now. Getting this guy down and out of this fight because he's either got an automatic weapon or a bump stock whatever the case may be he is just spraying bullets like it's cool and you got to stop him and put him down so two hands on the gun please yes. officers drop that light okay so now we see the officer who is is back in the back and, and we see what goes down they're trying here to get mom to come out of there and do that stuff and, and again I, I just want you to see how skylined they all are in this particular instance and you can see the continued barrage that's coming out the door once again, with this officer here, he's gonna kind of hug up on his, uh, you know, on his cover there. Now, the, the sergeant who got shot, I'm gonna say a couple of things here. He's hit in this particular instance, and he recognizes, I need to get myself to a spot. And this right here shows a good bit of professionalism. I mean, the dude is hit, he is trying to find cover, and yet, he does not endanger anybody else with good trigger finger discipline. That takes a real professional. This is the most incredible uh, finger discipline I've seen since the officer who got shot in the hand and still, while moving, managed to index uh, high and register with his firearm. Very impressive. This is the kind of thing that you only get by continual training, by practicing it again and again and again, and it being so ingrained in who you are that your finger is high and in register because you haven't made a decision to fire. So uh, kudos to him for that and for getting himself out of the danger zone. He then crawls his way to safety. Now, of course, you are responsible for yourself. Everybody else has a perp to deal with. So you go, man, I'm hit. You need to have your first aid kit on your person and to get yourself some help if at all possible because everybody else has to be engaged in, in getting that perp down. You're responsible for you. Absolutely, you, you have to have a tourniquet on your person, on your person at all times. Not back in the car, not in the trunk, not in the glove box. On you somewhere where it's easily accessible with one hand, by the way. Uh, on my tactical vest, I had my uh, tourniquet on right in the middle of my vest and I had it on with a rubber band so I could just rip it right off and not have to mess with anything. So he asked Sarge, Sarge, are you okay? Now we get this idea, somebody go get Bill. I think it's a natural inclination, but of course, that's a hot zone. You're not getting in there without putting the perp down. Yeah, some people might be like, well, they, they weren't brave enough. They should have gone in there and done that. Well, if you go in there and do that with someone who has something like an automatic weapon, you're just creating one more person that has to be rescued. You're gonna have a body pile. It's a calculated decision, but you have to recognize at this moment, the best thing you can do for Bill is find a way to get this suspect put down so you can get him safely. Otherwise, you just got one or two more officers in, in a, like you said, in a body pile, and that's suboptimal. You don't want that. I, I do think it's worth saying again. It's not because, wait a minute, why didn't somebody go in there and drag Bill out of there? That has nothing to do with bravery. That has everything to do with, I don't want to become the next victim because we're not going to get him out of there any more quickly by running up to him. What's gonna happen in that instance is we know that the perp is gonna come back out this door. He is going to, he wants to kill more cops. 
So again, the thing that we have to do in this moment is we have to stop the threat. That's the way to get to Bill. If this suspect was willing to shoot like that out that door, knowing his mother was out front, uh, there's nothing he won't do. There's absolutely nothing he's not going to do. So this is when everything counts. That I got to see the threat and I got to end the threat and I got to do that right now. And so here's my thing with, with Officer Moore in here on his badge camp. As you recognize right now, he, that guy, he, he's definitely skyline to that guy as well. If he misses low, he is gonna hit his partner here. He is gonna hit somebody who he has spent hours with, probably had dinner at his house and maybe, and those things. So, so again, marksmanship, in that moment, you will not be better than your worst day at the range. So you better make that worst day at the range good. I think some people think that, you know, in this, in this moment, I'm just gonna squeeze off rounds and it's gonna be fine. Marksmanship is so critical right now because what, like John said, whatever you're doing at the range, uh, you, you, if, you're, if you're not adding, uh, during your training, you're not adding stress, adding adrenaline, running around before you do something, you're not giving yourself a realistic scenario of what it's gonna be like to pull the trigger under this kind of stress. Yep, force on force is really where we inoculate ourselves to this kind of stress. And, and this is as high a stress as ever could possibly exist. Now, again, we're trying to find him, right? You gotta see him, you gotta put yourself in a place where, where you can see him, he can't see you, where you get to be first. And I actually really like here that this officer's trying to find a place where I've got a better angle on the guy that he does, he's not gonna see me before I see him, where I, I am going to be the hunter and not the rabbit. Very difficult spot to be here. And, and again, he's trying to figure out, wait, do I get out of the fight and help the sergeant or do I get back in the fight and, and win the fight? In my opinion, you gotta let Sarge take care of himself and stay in the fight. Absolutely. Another thing to think about officers, deputies, agents, hear me, where you park your car, where you position your car before you ever knock on the door is critical. Think about that. Make it part of your op plan that we're gonna park this car here, this car here. If you have a vehicle available to you that has that is up armored, a Suburban or something like that, not a Bearcat obviously if you're not a SWAT team, but if you have a vehicle that's relatively bullet resistant, make that your immediate cover. Put that in a place where you can utilize it in case something like this goes down. Just in case. And, and again, stay in the fight here. It's a hot zone right now. You have a hot zone. You have to, the thing that's gonna happen, if you spend time you know, doing first aid right now, you are gonna end up with more casualties otherwise. Next thing here, man, oh gosh, put the radio away. If you don't have a, a, a hot mic, you don't have an earpiece in, something like that, when the shooting starts, you're gonna wanna have both hands on the gun. So put the radio away. I get it, you wanna communicate, and, and we tend to over communicate in situations like this, but you have everything you need to win the fight on you right now. And, and you can't just back away and set a perimeter here. You've got a friend who is in desperate need of somebody to come and help. So this particular shot right here, I measured it out, and this officer needs to get a hit on the perp. And you can just see the back of the perp here, his white back right there. And uh, in this particular instance, he has about 14 yards. And, and of course, you know, somebody in, in the most inane comment ever might say, well, why would he shoot him in the back? In my opinion, you shoot this guy in the back until he changes shape or catches fire. The target that presents itself is what we shoot at. Um, obviously, this guy is beyond uh, in need of being shot. So yeah, whatever. If it was his foot, if it was the back of his head, his back, whatever, I don't care. Shoot that, whatever presents itself. And again, 15 yards under duress, not easy shooting here. Nope. So when we talk about that three to seven yard problem that a lot of times we talk about in private citizen gunfights, be that as it may, as a police officer, 15, 20, 30, 40 yards happen, you better be good with your gun. And again, long gun, long gun, long gun. You know, this, uh, this shot is so much easier, even with a slug, not even an AR, not even an AR but a long gun would have come in very, very handy. For any of these guys in any of these positions, a shot would have been a lot easier. And it sounds like you're going up against another long gun. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, again, can you win with a pistol? You can, but a long gun's preferable. Now, notice our officer here who has come back. He's taken several shots, trying to get into a spot with this guy that he can get him out of the fight. And, and what we're gonna see from this particular officer is he's gonna go back and, and get a different piece of cover and decide in a moment that he is going to proactively reload his gun. He's gonna decide, you know what, I know that I've got some rounds out of here and I don't want an empty gun. So he's going to get that gun into the fight in a good proactive reload here. So notice what he does first, is he is gonna actually go back to his vest and get the magazine. He still has a loaded gun that has a depleted magazine, but a couple of rounds in it. He, so he, but he goes and gets the magazine first, then brings the magazine up to the gun once he's got the magazine up to the gun, he releases the partially filled magazine, let it fall to the deck, great, and then puts a new magazine in the gun. That is a very good proactive reload. Now, 
he's done. He's got a round in the chamber and a good mag. But what he's going to do here that is a mistake is he is then going to come over the top and you're going to see him lose a round. He put a new mag in the gun because he wanted more ammo and he's going to lose one because under stress he goes, oh, every time I load the gun, I have to chamber a round. Don't fall victim to that, guys. It's definitely a training scar, although I kind of hate that term training scar, but it is a training scar for lack of a better term. And yeah, another thing to mention here is had he had to fire that as a Glock, if he had to fire it while the mag was out in that split second, he still could have gotten one round off. I don't fault him for this. This is definitely how he was trained through the academy, how he's trained every quarter, is the only time we reload our gun is when it goes, goes to slide lock or whatever. And so, yeah, he's, he's thinking, oh, I better, better chamber around. He lost one round. I'm not going to... I'm not going to give him a hard time it. about it. Yeah, but 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 why but why get rid of that round if you don't have to? Why get rid of it if you don't have to? So you didn't need to do that one. Now he's actually going to do another one here. He's going to get back in the fight and and have to uh, discharge some more rounds from his gun. This is why in police officer involved shootings, right? We see a lot more because they have to push the engagement. So we see a lot more reloads in cop gun fights than we do in private citizen gun fights. So he's going to decide here on the second time he's going to reload the gun again, but in this particular one he, he drops the magazine first and then goes and gets his secondary source of ammunition and gets another one. I agree with not keeping the tac, you know, attack reload or whatever, but watch how long it takes him because he drops the mag, then goes and gets the new magazine. And so for a number of seconds, he has a gun that's a single shot gun. So the order that we do this in, go get the new magazine, bring it up to the gun, then drop the old magazine, put the new one in, keeps your gun out of the fight for less time. He's on overload here for sure. He, he knows his friend's shot badly and might be dying. So I'm gonna forgive him for these of sort of these little, you know, these little mental errors. But you could tell from the first reload, he's practices. He's done this before. Officers, deputies, agents, please, please, please practice your reloads. Practice them at home. Get some dummy mags if you have to and just do reload after reload after reload from slide lock and the tactical top off, whatever you call it, tactical reload. Uh, you should be practicing that stuff every chance you get, every time you dry fire. Yeah, for sure. And again, okay, so they finally put this perp down. You can see his gun there sitting at the, the knees of the officer who unfortunately paid with his life. And listen, friends, I would be remiss if I didn't say to, to every single one of us that you need to practice spiritual fitness, which means every day before you go to work, you make sure that you've said everything you need to say to your family, that they know that you love them, that you've solved every conflict that you can, and that your relationship with Jesus is strong because you may not have any opportunity to get it on that day and you will need it. So get it now. And I get it. That makes me non-politically correct. And that means that this video may not well be shown in a lot of academies because it mentions that. This is my opinion and not the opinion of your academy or your sergeant or your department. But, but please hear me on that advice. You don't want your last thought to be, I wish I had. Amen and amen to that. So lots to learn here. Mike, I really appreciate the lessons. And again, our condolences to the family of the officer who paid with his life.